you know, we wouldn't be having this program this evening if it was not for the miracle of Zoom. Um, and our speaker this evening, Joan Frederick, is coming from uh, the West Coast. And her, but <laughs> her passion about the connections her mother made while she was living here in Rhinebeck uh, more than make up for that distance. Um, so tonight's program is about how our country's decision to enter World War II affected everybody. Uh, you know, whether it was in the cities, the small towns, and of course, in Rhinebeck. It especially impacted the lives of our young men and the lives of the women with whom they had or hoped to have a relationship. One of these women was our speaker's mother. And what I'm gonna do now is turn you over to Joan Frederick so she can tell you the story. Joan? Joan, go ahead. I'm talking, I'm sorry. Hi, my mother is Jean Elizabeth Bigelow Frederick and she's 99 years old. Not a robust 99, but a frail 99. Last fall, not knowing what was ahead in her care, I started to declutter her home of 70 years. And upstairs in her old bedroom dresser, I found plastic bags full of correspondence. I filled the recycle bin with the cards and letters from people I didn't know and had never heard her talk about. During the night, I got up and retrieved the letters from the bin with the thought that the Ryan Beck Historical Society might find them interesting as many of the envelopes had a Ryan Beck postmark, but I never sent them. I sorted the 565 letters by sender and put them in chronological order, finding that they dated from 1941 to 1946. When I began to read, I discovered a story. Eight young men I knew nothing about and two that I did, my dad and my uncle, and my maternal grandparents were sharing their views, experiences, and emotions about the war in their own words as they lived it. It seemed like found treasure that I wanted to share that I thought needed to be shared. All of the letter writers loved my mother and three proposed marriage. But it was not the romance of this story that I wanted to focus on tonight, but their observations on training, fighting, and being in service that created a tapestry of war experiences from all aspects of the war effort. In the summer of 1941, Maud Baird and Jean Bigelow moved into 65 West Market Street from Syracuse, New York, in search of milder climes for Baird. Jean started her junior year in September and began to make friends. She tried out for the cheer squad and made it. This provided the core of her social life. Edson McCord, Marion Swenson, Marcel DeGenis, Art Wright, and Bob Frederick were her closest friends. Edson lived on a farm on Slate Quarry Road with his father and older brother, Bill. The McCords hosted the young people for picnics and it was here that Jean met some older boys who were friends of Bill McCord. As a senior, she was editor of the school paper, The Idler, starred in and was stage manager of the senior play, What a Life, was president of the Girls Club and student council. I struggled with how to boil these letters down to a short presentation and came upon the idea of presenting each writer and their experiences in the military some experiences in their own word and some summarized. There are so many, many wonderful letters that I was not able to include, but the earliest letter we have is from Art Wright. Arthur Oren Wright was born on October 6, 1921 in Poughkeepsie. He grew up at 121 East Market Street and graduated in 1939 from Rhinebeck Central School. <laughs> Excuse me. Bill McCord was also in this class. Art met Jean at the McCord farmhouse. At the time, Art was working in Vestal, New York as a draftsman for a local contractor and mason, Rafe Willard. 
His first letter dated November 5th, 1941, quips, and I quote, friend Woolerton, and that would be Bill Woolerton, friend of arts and one of the correspondents, says that one JB, that's Jean Bigelow, is furious with one AO, Arthur Oren. Circumstances conspired to confound my visit. I shall guide my trusty Ford Rhinebeck word on Saturday to make things right. Ten days after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, Art was in Bermuda with his parents, hired on to help build the British airstrip there. This is their house in Bermuda with Art on his bike. On December 19th, 1941, Art wrote, Today I got an inoculation for typhoid and anti-tetanus. We have a wonderful water system. All the rainwater from the roof goes into a large tank down cellar and is pumped to the faucets. My trusty bike is serving me very well so far. Have to run through lots of mud. And it would be a bike that he brought from Rhinebeck. This is a slide of a January 9th, 9th 1942 letter. He's describing what it's like to go to Hamilton, Bermuda, which is um, via public transport. And I quote, to close your eyes will give you the impression that you're being tossed about in a rapid Manhattan subway. But on awakening, you realize you're doing the Bermuda Island speed limit of 20 miles per hour. Regular stops are made at Franks Bay, Lighthouse, Belmont Pass, Elbow Beach, and the rest of the stations. After 45 minutes of this, the eight, <clears throat> eight miles to Hamilton are accomplished. We are among the greater part of the passengers who disembark in the middle of the street and try to evade horses, bikes, and cars to get to the sidewalks. Return train leaves at 3.55 and shopping is governed accordingly. On January 20th, he warns Jean to keep French out of her letters as censors would hold same if they find anything but English. On March 11th, Art had attended a movie on the base and was walking home. It was a beautiful night in Bermuda, and I'm quoting. Storybook setting. The sky was black, spattered with the heavenly constellations. All was so quiet. I passed one spot from where the Negro voices of a night church gathering could be heard. The road gleamed white, but the trees and fields were as black as starlight will permit. At a bend in the road, I look across the still and dark waters of the bay reflecting the lights from jobs where men are still busy laboring for the good of our Uncle Sam and their pocketbooks. The tempo of horses' hooves crept into the silence reaching its climax and then decrescendoed as it passed me by. Believe me, thoughts of you were no small issue as I tried to conceive that all this was in fact and not between book covers. A new reality censorship was a constant source of concern. On May 6, he wrote, I have to be careful what I write. Any careless statements can bring reprisals from the censors. I may have the censors on my neck, but idle rumors have it the job will be completed by July. He was in fact back in Rhinebeck by August. In September of 1942, Jean is now a freshman at Syracuse University and the letters commence from Art again. And he says, seems funny to be writing with the thought that these words won't be censored. On that, when you got my letters, were they sealed? We had to leave them open. So I've been wondering ever since if they got a licking. And so you can see that from this envelope that they were both sealed and censored. Art enlisted as a CB in the U.S. Navy and reported to duty on November 30th, 1942. On December 30, reported that he was Seaman First Class Wright in Battalion 58, Company A, Platoon 3, at the Naval Construction Training Center in Norfolk, Virginia. He went on to say that the food had been good thus far and adds, you should see the haircut we got. All chopped, but a little on top. I think they spent all of three minutes on me. On February 8th, 1943, Art tells Jean that the order just came that their new address would be Cara Fleet Post Office, San Francisco, California. And so this is um, a letter, and you can see the censor 
stamp in the corner. And then there's a V-mail envelope as well that shows that these were um, stationary that they would photograph and put in, you were just allowed one page and it was censored and um, put in these little envelopes. And he says, this is a tough chore, this censoring. I've shot the bull before, but never had to go to this extent. They say I can say I went swimming, but not where. On September 9th, he wrote from Guadalcanal saying <laughs> he was sorry. He had not written, but lots had happened, which is, I'm sure is an understatement. And he hadn't much chance. On September 21st, Art shared with Gene that Admiral Halsey had complimented his CB outfit and he was proud to be a 58 CB. They had completely rebuilt the air, the airstrip on Guadalcanal. On November 8th, he told Gene that they were now permitted to say they'd been bombed on. His last island post was on Villa de Valle and was from here that he went he wrote on December 4th that he had been raised to ship's fitter third class and was now a petty officer and out of the seaman brackets. He was greatly pleased. Art took an R&R &R &R in New Zealand and contemplated his options and didn't much like his chances in the Pacific, so he opted to enter officer's training or the V-12 program. After landing in San Diego, he was sent in March of 1944 to Tufts College in Medford, Massachusetts, enrolled in engineering. He tells Gene that he's been demoted to the grade of apprentice seaman after all his hard work to achieve third class. In his third semester, he got transferred to MIT. When the war ended, it took Art another six months to earn the 60, 36 points necessary to be honorably discharged. And this occurred on February 17th, 1946. The second writer whose experiences we'll explore is Bob Frederick. Robert Benjamin Frederick was born on November 11th, 1924 in Rhinebeck, as were his mother and maternal grandfather, Benjamin Lane, before him. The Lane family lived in Rhinebeck starting in 1875. They lived on Oak Street at 23 and 25, and later other family lived at 14 and 19 Oak Street. Bob played the clarinet in the school band and they won state that year, and he was the lead in the senior play. His first letter to Jean was dated September 27, 1942, and was sent from Rhinebeck to Syracuse. He was 17. Bob lived in Park Plaza at 36 Parsonage Street with his parents and sister Alta. The times being what they were when Alta became pregnant in 1942 out of wedlock, they sold their house in Rhinebeck and moved to Connecticut to avoid gossip and scandal, leaving aunts, uncles, cousins, and friends behind. Bob stuttered. When he went to sign on with the Marines, this caused him to be deemed unacceptable for military service and was classified 4F. Next, he tried the Army. Same story. Bob's best friend growing up was Volney Shader, whose nickname was Son. Volney knew of jobs at the Kaiser Shipyard in Portland, Oregon. Determined to help the war effort from another angle, Bob and Son took themselves in search of work at Kaiser. They arrived at the beginning of July in 1944 and were housed in the Hudson House and Complex in Vancouver, Washington. Dearest Jean, this is um, July 8th, just got home from work, so decided it would be a good time to write you. Well, we arrived in Portland Tuesday morning, 8 o'clock, after a wonderful trip. I never realized all the things I've missed by staying home. This is really a wonderful country. Portland is quite a large city and crowded as hell. There are more people on the streets than in New York at 5 p.m., and that's a lot of people. We got our jobs Wednesday. Bob was hired on as an expediter in the warehouses and Son as a rigger on the ships. On July 20th, he and Son moved to Ogden Meadows Apartments from Hudson House. By August, he was in charge of the Russia orders and the warehouse and felt forced to join the union. All through August, September, and October, he worked graveyards seven days a week. 
And finally, on October 29th, he had a day off, saying that it sure felt good. This, um, this letter of January 13 is another look at what it was like in the shipyard. Had a wonderful Christmas and New Year's. Never had so much fun in all my life. Kaiser gave us a Christmas present, too. The Saturday before Christmas, they let things go wild at the yard. Nobody did any work, and nobody intended to. It was just a drunken mess. When you get 10,000 people penned up inside 180 acres, three-quarters of them drunk, you sure see some sights. Yes, I was among the majority. He and Sung bought a motorcycle to ride home on after the war. Sun crashed it, and they spent the next months trying to fix it to sell. They left for Rhinebeck on November 2nd, 1945, via Denver, driving an old clunker. They were home on the 16th of November. The third writer of interest is Jeannie's brother, Frank Bud Bigelow. Frank was Jeannie's older brother. He was born on March 22nd, 1917 in Buffalo, New York. He was seven years older than she. Frank was a truck driver with a pregnant wife when he enlisted in the Army Air Corps after Pearl Harbor. He trained as a bombardier and was stationed in Santa Ana and Barstow, California, Arizona, Texas, and Wyoming before being shipped to Africa as part of the offensive against Italy. And this November 16th letter, he says, graduation is only four weeks away, and due to a lot of changes here, the chances for me getting home are damn slim. If I don't get home, will you keep an eye on Ellie for me? I know I can depend on you. And Jeannie, if my luck does run out before the war is over, just forget the scratched out part. I'm all mixed up today. Well, Jean, I had better close this letter. Best of luck to you and write soon. Lots of love, bud. On November 30, he admonishes Jean to ignore his rambling in his last letter as he was feeling pretty blue that day and got to thinking a lot of foolish things. He ended by saying he was too tough to kill anyway. Frank made his first bombing flight from Africa as part of the 12th Air Force, 97th Bomb Group, 414th Squadron flying B-17s on July 21, 1943. On July 28, he told Gene that one of his best friends failed to return from a mission and that he had took it hard. On his 15th mission, B-17-22985, the Nutcracker, was shot down over Naples, Italy, and this picture is an AP shot of his plane going down. The pilot, co-pilot, navigator, and bombardier were all able to parachute to safety. The waste gunners and gunners went down with the plane, unable to get forward and out. Frank landed in a tree. His, harn his parachute harness severed a testicle, and he was rescued by the Italian underground. Ultimately captured by the Italian army, he was housed with the Australian and New Zealand pilots in Italy at Campo P. G-66. So when he went down on the 1st of August, all of his mail that they had written to him were, were returned. And so this is the first MIA letter that Jeannie was to receive. And you can see how they tore the side of the envelope to expose the return address. I think that's kind of interesting. And nobody knew whether he was alive or what was going on. In the meantime, Frank was moved on August 27th on his first leg of his trek into Germany and the prison camp <laughs> the American airmen were held. On October 13th, 1943, Frank arrived at Stellog Loft 3 in Sagan, Germany. Eventually over 11,000 prisoners were housed here. And this is where the American and Canadian airmen were. He sent a postcard or a brief letter each month assuring them that he was fine. At one point, he says he'll never eat anything in a can again. And in September, says that he's been moved into smaller quarters with five others, saying cooking and dishwashing were easier now. Ever careful never to talk about the camp or the guards. On January 28, 1945, as he was not part of the Great Escape, 
Frank, with the remaining 11,000 prisoners, is forced to march through the snow away from the invading Russians towards Munich and Spremberg. 130,000 prisoners are finally liberated on April 29, 1945, by the 14th Armored Division. On May 2nd, as Mother Maud writes Jean, now that the prisoners are liberated, she knows that Frank is getting some food and clean clothes. She said she's been limp ever since. Shaky, she guesses. Frank lands state ha stateside in May of 1945, meeting his daughter Judy for the first time. She was 18 months old. Our fourth individual of interest is Edson Harold McCord. Edson was born on April 30th, 1924 in Peekskill, New York. He had an older brother and sister. Unfortunately, his mother died of TB in 1931. The depression brought hardship and Samuel lost the Peekskill farm in 1937. The family moved to Delmore, Delaware where Bill finished high school. And in 1939, the McCords moved to Archer Lake Farm in Rhinebeck, New York. Now, in this picture, that's Samuel McCord, the father. This is my mother, Jean, and that's Marion Swenson, and they're taking target practice. Edson was Jeannie's entree into the social scene in Rhinebeck. Picnics with fellow cheer members and friends were some, something to look forward to. A few of the kids also took to hanging out at 65 West Market, listening to records and visiting. Edson developed a close relationship with my grandfather, Baird. I think from Edson's letters that they smoked Robert Burns cigars in the library. Anyway, Edson called him governor and held him in high regard and called himself senator and early on wrote more often to Baird than he did to Jeannie. In a letter to his father and brother, <laughs> Edson describes his day of induction. Well, it's now private instead of Mr. McCord ever since yesterday, and what a day. I hit the kips yesterday and started talking with a couple fellows, one guy from the shop. We made New York from the kips with merely the one stop at Harmon to Grand Central Palace. There the fun began, and I don't mean maybe. What a mob. We started at about one for our exams. I made my exit after being sworn in at about 6.30. Man alive, what a feeling after I saw that fatal word accepted <clears throat> on my fish sheet. And what a feeling after being sworn in. <clears throat> then I received my papers and passed to Fort Dix Saturday morning. <clears throat> on February 6, 1943, Edson wrote his brother that he had been offered the opportunity to become an instructor stateside, <clears throat> but could not live with himself if he took the easy road and chose combat and hell instead. He then tells Bill to disregard any crap you hear about bulletproof domes, windows, glass, or plexiglass mounted in any form on aircraft. That was only shit for jaybirds. On February 23rd, he tells Baird that his gunnery course in Las Vegas will be five weeks in duration and that at the end he would become a staff sergeant. From Las Vegas, he's transferred to Jefferson Barracks, Missouri. His first post posting in England comes in May at Old Sarum Airfield, Middle Wallop. In this letter, Edson tells Gene that he's just come in from a mandatory, mandatory jaunt through the hill and dales of Mary, England. He's a member of the 109th Reconnaissance Squadron F. He gets restless and requests a transfer. He ends up at Membury. Airfield in Lambourne, England. Now Edson is a member of the 9th Army Air Force, 153rd Liaison Squadron 4. Here he does ta tactical reconnaissance. Still chomping at the bit to get into action, on August 7th, he tells Jean of the envy he has for her brother, wishing he were in Africa as part of Frank's crew. And if you remember, shot had been, Frank had been shot down the week before. He continues his, continues his pestering of command to get transferred out of recon and into active bombing. On August 30th, Edson writes, tonight 
You find me in the blackest of moods, misery, dejectedness, restlessness, orneriness, aggressiveness, arrogance, belligerence, antagonizing, disgust, abhorrence, hate, spite, and anger couched in homesickness. This he wrote from Great Ashfield Aerodome as a member of the 385th Bomb Group, 550th Bombardment Squadron. On November 12th, he expresses his joy in receiving a letter from Jean, and he writes about their fantasy date when he returns to New York. A cool moon of May glows over the Isle of Manhattan. The realism of day is completely submerged in the slim shadows as of sleeping skyscrapers. The subdued sounds of evening issue from the streets of Times Square. Shall we go first to the Astor Roof where Harry James entertains and the wine flows in excess? Or shall we reserve that until after the buggy ride in Central Park? Personally, the latter is still hot, the high spot of the evening. Perhaps it should last, be last, being that it may last for quite a while. On November 20th, 1943, the crew of the Nan B landed safely at Asheville Aerodrome with three lifeless engines. They took 25 hits while bombing Bremen, Germany. Waste gunner McCord was carried from the plane unconscious due to lack of oxygen. They hit their targets nonetheless. The November 12th letter was the last one Jean received from Edson. She did receive flowers Christmas morning from him. On December 11th, Slow Joe and crew flew in the third wave of bombers that day against Edmund, Germany. Slow Joe and 14 other B-17s did not return. Edson's body washed ashore on Langoon Island on December 20th. Slow Joe had been shot down over the North Sea. The navigator, bombardier, and co-pilot lived and were taken prisoner. The others perished. Edson was buried on the island and moved to a graveyard in France after the war. So this is the MIA letter that came back from Mother's Christmas thank you letter. And you see it's torn to get access to the, um, and then on the back, missing in action from the squadron that he's in, the date that it's sent back, and the lieutenant that took care of the returning of the letter. And this is and this remained unopened until I opened it 75 years later. Edson, you know, you don't know. I don't know how I can begin to thank you for the beautiful, beautiful Christmas flowers. They came from Coons and arrived Christmas morning. Such a surprise and such a lovely one. They kept the house bright and cheerful for nearly a week. Dainty sweet peas, sturdy mums, bright Christmas poinsettia, snaps, and lots of other pretty kinds I don't know the name of. Anyway, Edson, thanks a million. I'll give you a big hug and a kiss when you get back. Believe it? Good night for now. Lots of luck. Love, Jeannie. On January 8, 1944, her mother Maud tells Jean that Edson was reported missing in action and hoped he would be in Frank's camp. His death was confirmed March 4th, 1944. In 1953, Edson's body was brought home and buried in the McCord family plot in Ossining. 65 West Market Street was now a funeral home. The application for the headstone to the military was made at 65 West Market Street. My first thought when I realized this was that I hoped my grandfather, who was now dead, and Edson had been able to smoke one last Robert Burns together in the library. So fifth on our list is Edson's older brother, Bill McCord. James, William James McCord was born in 1921 in Peekskill, New York. He had just graduated high school when he, Edson, and Samuel came to live in Rhinebeck. The first communication that Jeannie received from Bill was a postcard on November 2nd, 1943, from Knox College, Galesburg, Illinois, in which he wrote that he was an air student and asked her to write him. He was in the 302nd Cadet Training Detail. And this letter is interesting 
yes, because of what it says, but also because this was um, a letter and stationery all in one, and you folded it up and sealed it, and it was good to go. Dear Jeannie, that was a thoughtful letter you wrote, and I appreciated it plenty. It's been a terrific blow to us, and though in time we'll all get over it, it will take time. As you can readily guess, I'm mighty proud of him. He probably never told you, but he was given his choice of combat or instructor. You know his choice. He was brave and died bravely. I hope I can do half as well. There's little else I can say. I'm going to miss him terribly, and there'll be times when it'll be practically unbearable. I still can't listen to familiar music without getting thoughts of never to be again past good times. This is all foolish to write like this. You too feel bad and I and know what I feel, so it's senseless to write. He goes on to tell about his life in the in the army. In April, Bill is transferred to San Antonio Aviation Cadet Center in Texas. In April 2070, he wrote he was wild about flying, but he was crazy about Rhinebeck, as it's the best town in America. A year later, he was transferred to Barstow Airfield in Florida for further training flying P-51s. On May 3rd, Bill tells Gene that he's alive but disgusted with Army life and anxious to be home in the Garden of Eden, Dutchess County. He also thanks her for her kind words about Edson, saying, Few people realize how much that kid meant to me. Over and over in his letters to Gene and Bill, Edson wrote about his dream of owning a farm in Rhinebeck. He called it Dingy Dell. On May 14, 1945, Bill shared that his father had bought a farm from the Stewarts, hoping it was a nice joint. This is on Lemon Lane. Having never seen combat, Bill was separated from the Army Air Force on March 11, 1946. The sixth young man that wrote Mother was Bill Woolerton. William Wollerton was born on April 14, 1922, in New York City. He had a younger brother, John, who was a classmate of Jean's. John was born in Rhinebeck. Bill was friends with Art and the McCord brothers. This was how Jeannie met him. And he adds to this narrative not because of his friendship with Jean, but because of what he did during the war. He flew the China hump. The first letter we have was written to Art and is dated. January 20th, 1945. The return address indicated that he is affiliated with the 3rd Combat Cargo Squadron in India. In it, Bill tells Art that he's doing pretty much what he trained for at White Whiteman Air Base in Sedalia, Missouri, flying the Curtis C-46. Only now the stakes were for keeps. He talked about getting sick in the tail of the plane as crew chief, Five months later, he reports to Art that he no longer gets airsick, and he'd spent over 500 hours in the air. At this time, he had earned one battle star and air medal with an oak leaf cluster just for doing his job. By September, Bill is now stationed in Kunming, China. He tells Jean that he had picked up a little more fruit salad. Two more clusters on his air medal and a distinguished flying cross with one cluster. Again, he downplays his achievements by saying that all he did was a hell of a lot of flying and continued to do so. He also said that he had more hours than any other crew chief flying the hump. He tells her that Kunning is the best situation he'd been in with barracks, hot water, and a houseboy, just not enough food. This is the um, letter from China via the post office in New York. He was discharged in November of 1945 with 90 points, almost three times the number that Art had. There are a few letters from the last four young men, many from her mother and a handful from her father, but they are each significant in their own way. Norbert Ehrenfeun was a dear lifelong friend of Bill McCord from Peekskill. Norbert was born October 13, 1921, and his parents immigrated from Czechoslovakia in 1910. Norb is important because of what he went on to do. One of his letters on May 8th tells of the rewarding feeling that the liberating forces felt when marching through villages, towns, and camps in Europe after the war. And after the war, Norb hooked up with Stars and Stripes. 
the Armed Forces News publication, was on hand to cover the Nuremberg trials. This one experience changed his life. He came back to the States, got a degree in political science at Columbia, a law degree at Stanford, and went on to work in San Diego County as a deputy DA. Later, as a judge, he helped draft most of the policies in San Diego County that protect abused women and children. In 2007, he wrote Nuremberg Legacy, outlining how he felt the trials were a watershed in world foreign policy, holding individuals and countries accountable for crimes against humanity. Number eight in this list is Ray Fisk. Ray Fisk was born in 1915. He was Jeannie's chemistry teacher at Rhinebeck Central School. He came courting when Jean was at Syracuse, and his letters arrived some months after his proposal of marriage was rejected, much to his dismay. She says she could never get over the fact that he had been her teacher. Jack Lauder is number nine. He was born in 1924 and met Jean during her year at Syracuse University. While in officer training at Penn State, he took the train to New York City almost every Sunday to take her out to dinner when she was at Parsons Design School. There are only two letters from Jack, though. A Christmas card from 1944 calling her his dearest girl back home, and one from September 9, 1945, when he bemoans that he will be stuck in the Army for another year. There must have been others. They would have had a whole nother dimension to the story with another love interest. But I don't know why they didn't get saved. And number 10 is Lewis Pels. Lewis was the son of the uh, principal of Rhinebeck Central School and was in Jeannie's class at school. He didn't write till after the war. He was born in 1924. And um, he's not important for that one later letter that he wrote seeking her friendship, but that he crossed paths with Austin Frost in Belgium. Now, Austin Frost was another casualty of the war. Lewis was treated for trench foot, and Austin was killed five weeks later. Then we have her mother and father. Her mother, Maud, wrote often, always concerned for Jeannie's help, warrants dry feet and financial status. They were newsy and dear. And her father wrote on occasion and always with sage advice. When Jeannie was struggling with the dilemma of whom to give her heart to and how to extricate herself from the one she did not choose, Baird wrote, as you grow older, you learn by experience and that the only way to fight is to brace right with it and meet it standing up. It is damn hard sometimes, but in the long run, is the only thing that brings complete satisfaction. Well, I hope this piqued your interest in further reading about the intertwining of these 11 individuals from Rhinebeck. There are copies of the book for sale at Oblong Books, and I can send you a copy for $25. And my address is 47 Auburn Avenue, Sierra Madre, 91024. Let me know if you're interested, and I'll be glad to get that in the mail to you. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. And Michael, if you're ready to start speaking again, please unmute yourself, because I had muted you during the, during the presentation. We'll leave this slide up for another moment so people can see uh, Joan's address. Joan, that was spectacular. I mean, you you have uh, you use the word tapestry here, and that's really what this is. Uh, you know, the variety of responsibilities that these young men found themselves in during the war varied enormously, and it's just fascinating hearing these details that you've shared with us. Uh, you know, hearing about <clears throat> the uh, art right going, you know, heading right down to Bermuda as soon as war was declared before anybody got drafted. Uh, and then later on returning to the States and uh, joining the military at that point. And he served in so many different venues. And I mean, I, I'm not going to try to recap all of them, but Edson's story is really a very moving one. And it's remarkable that your mother 
save those hundreds of letters uh, and they really tell us such a deep give us such a detailed picture of what the war was all about and how it affected everybody back home and how it affected these young men they you know not being able to say where you are or in many cases you know not even what you're doing um is got has to be very difficult and everybody at home is wondering what you're up to um so thank you for sharing this and uh having gotten in touch with us to uh tell us about your book that is now for sale at oblong i understand they have about a dozen copies last we checked and uh or you can as joan said order it directly <clears throat> from joan herself i'm going to close the share share uh so that we can actually see joan and we have questions in the chat and hands may be raised so i'm going to pass over to jeff to see if he could pull those uh questions and uh, direct them to g Okay. I don't have any questions that came directly into the chat, but as Michael okay. point as Michael pointed out, uh, if you have a question or a comment you want to make, go down to the reactions button at the bottom and raise your hand. Or if you have your um if you have your camera open, just wave and we'll call on you. Okay. I see I we see have any. a very, very modest uh no one is is uh, sticking their nose out there and asking any questions at this <laughs> yeah, point. I, I think it was a wonderful talk. And I, I have to look. At, I gave a talk about uh, Frank Asher's 2000 photos that I scanned, mostly taken in the 1940s and 50s of Rhinebeck. And he, a, a lot of those pictures that you were showing were taken by Frank Asher. I, we have the original negatives, as well as I'm going to try to find them over the weekend and send them to you. Frank took everything in town, everybody, every person. It was amazing a piece of history that he photographed. And he and he also was the school photographer. And he took pictures of 1942, 43, 44, 45, and 46 classes of Rhinebeck High School. And like the 42 classes, mostly boys and a few girls. And after that, it's like all girls and like three or four boys. And so I'm going to find them in the collection and mail them to you. You could probably find uh, your mother in, in one of the pictures and probably find some of these boys as well in the pictures. I didn't think of that until just now. Um, but anyway, it was a great piece of history that um, we got out edited over the weekend and get it up and send the announcement out to our Facebook page, our website users, all of our members. And as we said, people will start looking at it um, at their I own think, leisure. Yeah, Dorothy Oxner has a raised hand. Dorothy, if you could unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question. I left you a chat message, uh, Michael. Okay. Yeah, so you have um, to check your chats. You might have some. Um, I thought that was a great presentation, Joan. Um, and but I my question is, did you do some get some military records? Yes, <clears throat> I I was able to get Edson's military records, which the family didn't have. And a lot of the research, I was able to reach out and make contact with the children and grandchildren of every every one of the of the boys. Oh wow! So I'm my my goal is to eventually send them the letters so they have them. And um, it um, the research it took a lot of research to get to just be able to say he was in Guadalcanal because that's not on the envelope. So you have to have the military record to know how the dates coincide with the military record. So I have Art's military record and Edson's. And were you able to get them right away, or did it take? Oh, so it, it took a year. Yeah, me and too. I was I had forgotten I'd even asked for them, and they yeah. came through the email, and I, I said, "What, what is this?" <laughs> so no, I got five pounds worth in um of documents, paper, 
my whole uncle's uh, military file, everything. They must have been on microfilm and and then they printed off every piece, <laughs> every slice well, of, of microfilm. That actually it was literally over five pounds of paper. Oh wow! I, yeah, it took it took a year to get it, but and a phone call, took a phone call, <laughs> and then seven days later I got the package. <laughs> That was great. My my aunt was an army nurse, and she flew the hump in um, from Burma to uh, India. But I hey. and I can't get her records because they apparently were destroyed in the fire in St. Louis in 1973. That's I was reading a great novel about uh, flying the hump by a, a, a um, his name is H.W. Bernard and he wrote about 15 uh, books on um, it was called They Flew no When Heroes Flew is the name of the series and I, I, I haven't looked into any of the others but uh, I'm sure that there are he's, he's talking about other um, experiences of other pilots so. Maybe, Dorothy, you might uh, do what Joan did and take all that material and put it together into a narrative and I am. I'm writing join it. us for a future program. <laughs> well, that'll be probably quite a while. <laughs> yeah, I'm right. I, I had five, four uncles and one aunt that were all in World War II, and I'm writing a, a, um, a chapter on each one. Good for you. I, think, I haven't started yet. I'm still doing research, so waiting for more records. That's wonderful. I yeah. I think uh, you know reading in the uh, uh, back part of Joan's book, I I saw the list Joan of all the individuals you had contacted. You know the relatives of the servicemen, most of whom are are now deceased. Um, you know, and it was an enormous, but but that was an important part of learning who they were. Well, I also did their ancestry chart, mm -hmm. right. which gives a whole diff different information so that you have their their family as well as the individual and then the, the current generation. So it's... Uh, mm -hmm. okay. I have... think this was a, this was this was a terrific, uh, you know, and and uh, what you've presented to us, Joan, and and also Dorothy, what you've mentioned, and it would be good to hear more about that because these provide such an intimate portrait of these these young young men, um, and and your mother, and um, what they were faced with and how brave they were and how either matter of fact or in so in at least one of those letters expressing some fear and apologizing for it later but and and some of them gave their lives and suffered uh prisoner of war camps um just just phenomenal stories and and thank you so much for um sharing them with us and explaining if if any by the way if anyone else has a question or wants to just jump in you can just unmute yourself and start and we'll listen to you go ahead joan i wanted to say hi to mario <laughs> hi joan i'm here with dean and we enjoyed your presentation champion thank you thank you it was wonderful thank you for being my champion our pleasure our pleasure <laughs> Nice to see you. And this must be your wife, right? And and this, I it, it was a fascinating presentation. I'm just wondering if you have had any inkling of of what your mother went through in this period. Did was there ever any mention of it in the family? She was at school and try and working to support herself. And I know that she wrote to other young men who were also in the service that we don't have the letters to when I did her albums. So oh, that was somebody I wrote to. That was so I think it was what the uh, the women did. They wrote to the men in service. Mm -hmm. And um I think her greatest angst 
was that she fell in love with art and my dad. So her greatest angst was over who to choose and how to choose and how, how to deal with that. And right. see, Ray Fisk asked her to marry Art, asked her to, my dad did, and the writing instructor at Syracuse. So she had four proposals. <laughs> but she was um, not only beautiful, but I think that she was um, had an outstanding personality. She certainly, you know, her credentials from high school uh, tell us that she was a leader mm -hmm. and she knew how to get along with people and uh, was very interested in being a part of an important part of the community. And, you know, before, um, you know, and, and her ability to maintain those relationships through this letter writing um, is really fascinating. And, you know, these these are primary source documents. And to have this many letters, um, so many from some individuals uh, during this relatively brief span of years tells such a, I mean, I've, I've seen in your book some of the other letters that you didn't quote here today. Awesome. Uh, but, it, but it gives us such a comment comprehensive view of what the war was like. Uh, you know, it really changed everybody's life uh, in this town. And uh, appreciate your having shared that, sharing it with us. And we will be, uh, David will be editing this and posting it on uh, the Rhinebeck Historical Society website. Um, and uh, yeah. So thank you so much. And unless great there, presentation. We really yeah. you were terrific. Thank you, thank you so much. It was really fun.